And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother to the temple, previously the madman behind Slain and Velfaris. Now coming back with the recently released Velfaris Mecha Therion, the the man with the gift of metal, the one and only Andrew Gilmore. How you doing today, man? Oh well, thanks for letting me back into the temple. <laughs> thank you for thank you for coming. I'm back happy in. to be back here, of course. <laughs> yeah, you had you had hinted that the next that about the follow up to Velfaris the last time I had you on. So of, of course, when the follow up actually comes. I felt it was only natural to bring you in. Oh, oh yeah, thank you. Now, I do. F I looking back, I do find it amusing that at first I thought you were in s with Slain. You were inspired by old school Castlevania, when really it was um, Ghosts and Goblins. And right. with Valfaris, was I? Th I think we had talked. I think we had talked about Contra at one at one point in that For discussion. Sure, yeah. Oh. And I, I do remember ranting about how much how much I feel that whoever designed the laser in in Contra should be flogged. Cause seriously, that <laughs> thing sucked. Um, Bro, there you go. But with with Mecha Therion, you were I knew that I knew at the time you were doing Mecha. I didn't know that you were going to be doing a um scro a scrolling shooter. Uh, so I get I guess. The I guess the best place to start is the origin story of what was your first introduction to the, to the concept of um of that sort of some people have called them rail shooters some call them side scrolling shooters yeah. that particular style what was what was your first introduction to that oh, well obviously the arcades mm -hmm. and playing um, games like Defender Scramble. <laughs> Where you're like dropping bombs, like switching um, screens and stuff. Gradius, uh, obviously Gradius, R type, um, and one of the ones that I was really drawn to because I, you know, um, started up using the Spectrums and the Ataris was uh, a game called Xenon or Xenon, however you want to like pronounce it, which was a Bitmap Brothers game. I love this kind of organic, kind of weird shooter that our type was as well. So um, I guess that was my introduction to those types of games. And I always thought they'd been kind of um, like misrepresented in in their power of what they can do these days. So me and Thomas thought we'd give it a shot and uh, do a shmup <laughs> or a shoot 'em up, let's call it. Yeah. Like a side scrolling one, um, still in the same universe. And we had this section in Valfaris that was already uh, where Baron gets a jetpack and like flies around and like shoots stuff up. Mm -hmm. But we had to cut all that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so we just, it was like, you know, can we just do that game with Therian in the jetpack? That'd be kind of fun to do. So it'd be kind of like Lunar Jetpack from the Spectrum days, but this kind of. Uh, um, like hack and slash shooter as well. <laughs> yeah, no, and it kind of got refined. Yeah, the the closest analog I can think of from what from what I had been playing with um, Mecha Therion was um was was Astabreed, which also had that mixture of shooting and and slashing in that kind in that kind of affair. There's prob there's probably a few others that that I could potentially think of, but those are the big ones. For me, I'm just, I'm just glad to be, I'm just glad that that's slow, that's slowly been making a comeback over the last few years because, for the longest time, the the um, shmup was dominated by bullet hell, and right. I can enjoy bullet hell to a point, but the problem the problem is for for me the appeal of shmup is a very pick up and play affair, and bullet yeah. hell is a vi is a very hardcore affair where you're where you have to move with millimeter levels of precision with some, with right. some of those screen with some of those screen filling attacks well and... this uh, like, makes me think of one of the games that inspired this as well that we didn't get into doing was like geometry walls like mm -hmm. on um 
like when the Wii came out, I think that was like uh, one of the first like ones on there. And it was this insane kind of. Um, it was like Robotron. It was like Scramble. It was like a, a shoot 'em up as well. Yeah. It was like crazy, crazy shapes. So uh... yeah, they. I guess they just. I guess they decided what what game should we be, and somebody said all of them. There you go. Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> Um, right. Yeah. And of, of course, of course, when it comes to shmups, there's been there's there was in the mid two thousands and the early twenty tens. I ended up going down a rabbit hole with the um with the Dojin shmup scene, much like the Dojin shmup the um shmup scene, not shmup um um fighter scene in that same Dojin crowd. Sure. And go, and going into the going into the various um. The, yeah, the various is, games that came, that came that came around in the in those fan con, in those fan conventions, because some, well, some I, of them were absolutely nuts, especially when they were designed by such a small um, team. And why? it's nice to see that that nice to see that kind of thing ca carry um, forward. And yes, Toho was was is also in that Dojin style as well. It's just the. Again, the problem that I, that I always had with Bullet Hell is just the sheer amount of st the sheer amount of stuff and the sheer precision that it demands. Bullet. You know, it's, <laughs> it's a high it's a high floor affair. And right, I mean, well, when we started doing this, it was um, yeah, we're gonna get do do a shoot up. It's gonna be good. It's gonna be side scroll. It's gonna be like all this stuff, but. Realizing how deep the shoot 'em up culture has gotten since that I left it, um, was was quite you know like a, a cold shower, I guess. <laughs> it was like okay, there there are people that are really into this genre. Should we just go in there and fuck it up with our stuff? Yeah, whatever. Because I kind of really wanted to play this type of game, and it's a little bit. Uh, which is a little bit hack and slash. It's a little bit like a shooter as well, and it's uh, you know, we branched out into our three D stuff, which I love being there. Yeah, you've yeah. you've gone from you've gone from doing sprite work to doing, um, I'd say I'd say almost PS almost um, PS one like graphical styles, especially with some of the texture warping, if I'm if I'm accurate. No, I hope we don't have any texture warping. We try to avoid that stuff. <laughs> oh, no, I don't mean that. I don't mean that as a, as as a put down or something like that. But that, but that, no, I, that I, heavily you... angular st style with polygons. Because this uh, trend of uh, retro games has come to produce all these bad things that we try to do, not to do, I should say, back in those days, like texture warping, all the vertex wobbling. Like the PS One stuff, where you're getting like all that vertex wobbling going on, it's, and it's, the texture stretching going it's, on, and warping. It's like that just showed that you were bad at doing your job. Um, <laughs> like back I in see, those days, and I, how trendy it's become now is like that is a that is the mark of a retro video game. Is if you have all these bad errors. <laughs> um, what I what I mean, but what I mean by that is a lot a lot of people dub um. Doubling down on a on a st on style is in terms of ha in terms of having a visual identity as opposed to fidelity, and it's something I've always um, championed that a, a a strong a strong visual identity will will win out over realism any day of the week. Yeah, I mean, it realism depends. Is, on... Realism is going to age. It's what. Depends on what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Like I play, um, like DCS, for instance, mm -hmm. like a Digital Combat Simulator. Yeah. Very high yeah. fidelity planes, uh, with all the buttons and all the clouds. I want realism there. Yeah, that's it. There's no, there is no like chance of fantasy coming in here. Sometimes I look out the window and I hope to see a UFO go by, but that's never going to be in that game. And I'm not. I'm not saying either. Either one is a universal approach to take, but well, it's there. There are different I will, ways. I will always appreciate variety. Is my it has been my whole thing. The crusade I've been I've been on for the past nine years has been to showcase what is out there. 
Oh. Yeah. Now, of course, there's the there's the mecha end of end of things that I that I kind of have to address. And what was your first introduction to mecha? And in your in your um, estimation, what would you say is the appeal? So my first introduction would be in the eighties, watching G Force Battle of the Planets mm -hmm. kind of thing, where all these kind of and of course. Uh, if we're talking about back then, <laughs> um, God, what was it called? Uh, I can't remember. Um, so yeah, it was but this introduction of oh yeah, the Thunderbirds, tons of mechas, kind of the same battle of the planets like vibe. Everybody in different spaceships that come together in the end of form this like awesome thing that just destroys. Yeah. You know, later forming into Transformers, into all of that kind of stuff as well. Uh -huh. um, did you ever get into Battletech back in those days? I guess. I've been in Battletech cabinets. <laughs> <laughs> of course. And I've worked on um like a Robotech game on the on the SNES, I think, when I was working at Game Tech mm. that never got released. And Robotech was I was gonna like bring up next. Like that was probably the next step of like, okay. Yeah, although um... I think these Veritechs are nice. I like what they're doing. <laughs> yeah. I like what they're doing. Not so warm on Harmony Gold, but that's another story. Well, I see. Yeah, I guess I'm not really into the story that much. Um, I just, I just look at the artwork and the technology and stuff that they'll portray, and the story is kind of like always secondary, as it probably shows in the games. Oh, I've always, I've always held the. I, there's, there's been a long debate on the whole story versus gameplay thing, and I've always been in the attitude of. If you're if you're treating them as as if they have to be adversarial, I think you're doing things wrong. Uh, yeah, for because sure. one one can it because whenever that kind of conversation is brought up, whether from fans or designers, they're the idea of them of the of the two being complementary to each other is never addressed, and that I always find I always find annoying. It's like you have to be you have to focus on one or the other. You can't do both. No, and nobody's given me a good reason fair. why. No, you can totally do both. I'm just not really mm -hmm. that much interested in the story as yeah. the predominant driving driver of me through games. Yeah, you're not, so you're not a novelist. I know, you're not a uh, I, know I've, I know I've sent you this gif or, or video of like Vasquez from Aliens just going like, just show me where they are. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And... That's, it. That's what I want to know. Where's the biggest axe? Where's the biggest sword? How do I get to be more powerful? Yeah, do you want to hear the lore behind this sword? No, not really. Yeah. Am I bored at night and read the lore behind the sword and go like, oh, that kind of makes it better? Of course. Hmm. <laughs> um, I know. I know that there was that comment from Carmack about sto about story in games is like story in a porno, which I think I like Carmack, but I think he was. I think that um, <laughs> analogy was a little bit much. <laughs> I haven't heard that before, and I, yeah, I kind of get it. I kind of get, I kind of get it, but at the at the same time, it's one of those things that sh that um, you can't. I, as... Yeah, I started working. You know, mm -hmm. when I was working at Naughty Dog, for instance, I'm working on Jack and Daxter games. Mm -hmm. These are great. These are like fun games. They're good. They're gamey. They're high fantasy and everything. Mm -hmm. And making that transition to working on on an Uncharted was like no. I don't want to do this. <laughs> yeah, you know, but the studio decides like where that is, and that's going more into realism. Now we're building like realistic guns. Now we're building realistic people, and we're shooting them. In Jack and Daxter, it wasn't that way. Yeah, and when it came, um, whenever it whenever it comes to to that, I, I remember around that time there was that whole debate. There was that whole debate about whether or not games can be can be art, and it seems like the answer to that was to make was to make games that that act like movies and i'm like you guys are going it's that's complete that is completely wrong games have always been art they've just been a different kind well yeah i mean uh, yeah. as an artist i believe that you know that's in the um the eyes of the the onlooker i guess is like the whole beauty, it's beauty in, this, in, the eyes of, in the eyes of the beholder right well, i didn't want to say beholder <laughs> why, why you, do, you don't you know, want to get <laughs> except for the 
it's up for the person looking at it and experiencing it to work out whether that's art or not. Like an artist telling you this is art, and then you buying it as art, uh, sounds a little bit like a scam. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh. Oh. Now, with that, with that in well, mind, looking back, look, it is kind of is kind of amusing to me how even even with the different control scheme, um, it didn't it wasn't it didn't take long for me to jump right jump right into uh, Mecha Theory on to the point where I, I could easily see somebody playing Valfaris and then playing Mecha Theory on back to back with each other. Um, was that right, one right. of the design goals early on? Was to ha was to have it have that concurrentness? Yeah, of course. I wanted like. Um... It to feel like uh, Valfara's buddy in a mech, mm -hmm. and that thing, yeah, there was the the mech parts in Valfara's where you're like just running around and like you know just destroying everything. And it's kind of a little bit of a reward for the player to get there and just like crush everything for a little bit. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, that was a harder game. I think Valfara's uh, mecha is a little bit uh, easier for people to get into to play. It's not as punishing, but we have like some of the hardest modes in any of our games. Yeah, and I'd say a, I'd say a bit of like it, like I said earlier, it did the difficulty that I saw back with Slain certainly came into f picture when you said that your inspiration was Ghosts and Goblins, which is in the, is is always in the conversation when it comes to the more notorious examples of Nintendo hard from those days. Yeah, it was a. It was meant to be a cruel game. Was this to a lot of doom metal? All to the used to be doom. It's meant to be like a slog in order to get through stuff. And based on Ghosts and Goblins, which is like a very cruel game. So Slain is probably the cruelest of all the games. <laughs> for yeah. sure. And of course, of course, the. I'd be remiss if I didn't point out the fact that the in the when it came to Crash Bandicoot, since you mentioned your time with Naughty Dog. There's the fact that the death animations in those games almost feel like it's mocking you. <laughs> and that's like uh, the same in uh, Slain. I wanted to make the two things I was focusing on is like um, how you die mm -hmm. as a character and how you kill things. And now, gr now, granted, Crash was drawing was drawing. I'd, I've never gotten confirmation, but the but those death animations always stick in my mind as. Being very Chuck Jones esque, right? Yeah, very cartoon. Mm -hmm. You know, some, I think something Slane, I could see Wiley Coyote yeah. doing. Yeah, yeah. Slane is definitely um, inspired by all of that stuff. It's like very cartoon deaths. And I just come off of uh, working out there in Green Bay, working on Metalocalypse game. Mm -hmm. So, like, I'm doing all this like comedy, like horror, <laughs> murders, <laughs> like yeah. all the time. And I, th I could swear I recall you br you bringing up experiences with say with reading like heavy metal and white dwarf in in the past. So that's certainly a factor as well. Well, not really um, heavy metal. That was kind of there, but white dwarf for sure. Mm -hmm. Every month going there and getting that magazine from W. H. Smiths. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that fresh magazine smell. Yeah, it's, one of the, yeah. one of these days I want one of these days I want to do like a um retroactive read through of of scans of, of the of um magazines like like White Dwarf or um Dragon. And, and uh, Dragon as well, quite a bit too. Especially especially since I I went down a yeah, rabbit hole a while back with the ask the sage questions and some of the questions I feel yeah. are prime material for memes. Um, especially, especially the whole the whole thing of can can a shield spell block a laser? <laughs> Which it turned well, yeah. out according to this according to the sage, no. <laughs> or the whole um, do barbarians eat quiche? Which I ended up finding out after the fact was an in joke be, be based on a book of the same name. And well, in, uh, in White Dwarf, yeah, say that's a yeah. Throw the barbarian. There you go. And well, well, you did well. War, early Warhammer did have a character named White Dwarf, named, named the White Dwarf. So, right. Yeah. But I have to like be honest. Like 
I guess since about 2000, I haven't really been keeping up with like Warhammer or Dungeons and Dragons or all those things that kind of started me on my path. Mm-hmm. Which I just is... got kind of lost in my own path, and when I came back to them, they kind of weren't there anymore. <laughs> yeah, I um, I've I've always I've always jumped around between a bunch of different th- a bunch of different things that ha- that hasn't changed. So what my so what my pa- what my path was was well whatever whatever I am whatever I happen to be exploring at that mo- at that moment. Sure. But I would say of now with with that in with that in mind I am cu- I am curious cuz I I don't think I asked what what prompted the shift away from sprite work and into um into the into this more um po- polygonal style was that something that you had always intended to eventually do or was the, or was there a different chain of events that led to it well um do you want to pause for a second while I get another beer <laughs> Is that a second in actual time or restaurant time? Oh, that'll be 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. I can pause for 30 seconds. Yep. Like, I always have to ask if it's actual time or restaurant time just in case, because you know how it is. They say five minutes for a table and it ends up being 20. Sure. Well, maybe I don't go out anymore. But... (laughs) Oh, yeah, the shift. Right, like, I'm not really sure what we're doing yet, but it kind of feels like we're getting into the situation, which is um, kind of what I wanted to do. I wanted to, like, uh, the games that I'm making mm-hmm. at the moment to kind of parallel uh, my journey through the games industry as well, starting, you know, right there in, like, 1989, making video games. How it was all pixels. Then we kind of like did some digitization, like doing pre-rendered stuff, which is about far us. And then one of the most difficult times, like being in the industry in in those days, was um, that switch between being a pixel artist and going on to doing low poly and 3D stuff. And because it was a very it was a very technical step. Oh yeah. <laughs> Like, you had to, like, know computers good and know how memory worked good and know, like, how the system works. Like, all these things really good. Um, so it kind of felt like the pixel art was redundant because now you're trying to, like, up all your textures. You're trying to get, like, OpenGL on them and stuff to make them all look blurry and stuff. Mm. <laughs> Which now, none of that is cool. Um, yeah. So I think... Uh, I'm paralleling what uh, my experience was in the games industry. So now I'm moving in, I'm making that move of um, moving from pixel art to, which I love, the low poly 3D stuff. Mm-hmm. And it's, the, it's definitely an interest, it's definitely an interesting adventure. And I'm, I am a bit, I'm a bit curious given the worlds that you set up with Slain and now the what I'm going to call the Valfaris duologies so far. Sure. Is did before you even started with Slain, did you end up writing like a like a Bible or a, or a similar design doc just setting up the world that you were trying to create? Well, um I've been trying to create that world for like twenty years, I would say. So it's already all in place. <laughs> By the time I got, you know, to the point of starting slaying, like I knew exactly what was going to be going on, mm-hmm. because I'd already drawn everything, I'd already thought about it, I'd already listened to all this stuff, and now we're, we're on the third game, mm-hmm. and I think we're just getting started. Like now, I feel as though I've got, we've got a good foothold, as though we can really get. Um, the style of the games and even the story out. Mm-hmm. But I knew, I knew it was going to take three games. <laughs> and obvi- obviously, with each with each subsequent en- entry, there's opportunities to further expand it. Yeah, I like leaving those um, doors open for myself mm-hmm. along the way, and uh, you know, we can go back to them and open them. If we want to. 
not like kind of like Star Wars, <laughs> like going back and finding some obsolete character, you know, plotting, being you know, oh yeah, can we open that door now? So yeah, you should have opened that before, but whatever. Yeah. There's been. The... So there are like avenues for me to branch out wherever I want to and whatever I want to do next because it's laying that uh, laying the groundwork for something. Mm -hmm. And the key th the key thing with this sort of um, si science fantastical science fiction one one might say is there's not really much of a limit to what you can't do. Ah, there. This is video games. There's no limit to what we can't do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, vid video game or not, just a, just as a just as a storytelling perspective, if you were do if you were doing if you were doing something more grounded, obviously there'd be a ceiling into into what you could do. But in the, in this kind of um, setup, there's well, a significant amount more freedom. Yeah. We can, you know, me and Thomas have these discussions and, like, we just come up with ideas and, like, that's it. Mm -hmm. If it's a good idea, we just do it, put it in the game. Yeah, and given the recurring presence of the sword Batherin th throughout the games, I'm, there's a small part of me that wonders if one of your, if, um, one of the things you were drawing upon was the, um, Elric books. Because um, in a roundabout way, Batherin kind of reminds me of Stormbringer. That could be me reading too much into things. I do fully admit that. Yeah, well, I don't know much much of Elric, Journey, Michael Moorcock. I have, like, uh, my wife is the book person. We have libraries and a lot of Michael Moorcock. <laughs> Which is, is certainly fair. He's yeah. He's definitely I, I in that it. heavy metal and heavy metal leaning stuff. Oh. He even he even Hawk spearheaded Wind. his own band. <laughs> no, no, I wouldn't. No, he did not spearhead Hawkwind. <laughs> well, he, cer he certainly endorsed it. Right, Hawkwind was there, and Lemmy's there too, playing bass mm -hmm. in Hawkwind, while yeah. Michael Moorcock is like recanting his like uh, proverbs over it. It's like, oh my God, and those album covers. Mm -hmm. And, Brilliant. And definitely inspiration yeah. for me. Um, now you... But yeah, I haven't really read any of it too much. Mm -hmm. I kind of like the character. Yeah. And I'm not. I'm not expect. I'm not expecting you to have to have read the whole series. The whole series out of that because there's a lot. There's a lot of books in that Eternal Champion universe. Yeah, they're kind of hard to find as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh and of, co of course, there of course there's been plenty of attempts in um t in tabletop games over the years. With when it comes to when it comes to that universe, not some not so much video games unless you want to count the Legacy of Cain games, which I guess is the I guess is the closest thing. Even though even though yeah, I, I think even though I think Dyak had said he was drawing upon Wheel of Time for Blood Omen. Yeah, well, working in Naughty Dog again, I used to work with Amy Hennig, who was the, uh, the writer on there. And, uh... <laughs> I, I shouldn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, with it, where do you... Yeah, but there definitely is a comparison all the time with Edric and uh, um, Legacy of Kane. Mm -hmm. But, when it comes to when it comes to sci when it comes to science fiction and fantasy, do you would you say that you lean more into the, into the fantastical end where where um things aren't where things aren't as technical? No, yeah, definitely. Yeah. For fantasy? yeah, definitely high fantasy. I would say it's like high fantasy sci-fi is like um you know well how does this work? It's magic. <laughs> kind of thing, but you know, as you're working on that, uh, sometimes you actually kind of work out how it works and then explain it. <laughs> I've always held the belief that you you can do the it's magic as long as the magic is consistent. Yeah, as long as it's a standard or a constant, let's say through it, um, it it's definitely a a building platform for yeah. sure. Yeah. 
with within story or gameplay, whatever you want it to be. Mm -hmm. Like if you ha if if you have it that's that somebody needs a um a cer a certain item in order to use their magic, and then and then you have them using magic without it with and don't explain that, then that becomes a problem. Oh. Mm -hmm. I yeah. The analogy I, of, I often bring up with this was why the whole, the whole thing with Zod and, and Man of Steel annoyed me. You know, they they spent so much of the film establishing that the Kryptonians can't handle that, end up getting sensory overload from that amount of sunlight, so they need filters. And then Zod just true? takes his stuff off and says, "Well, I trained my I trained my whole life to master my senses, as if that ex as if that's a enough of a justification for why he's not tripping balls." Is that a Superman thing? Yeah. Okay, yeah. See, I don't really do comic books. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know anything about them. I grew up, like, there's Superman, there's Batman, there's Spider-Man. Yeah. And then we and... have the whole bit, and then it, it is now just crazy. There's all these, like, actors that kind of are, you know, I'm a Marvel-based artist. Mm -hmm. Like, but I, 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 yeah, I learned to draw on how to draw comics the Marvel way. <laughs> yeah. And these humans do not look correct in these outfits. They look kind of silly. <laughs> I've al I've always told people to to re to relish in to relish in the silly, but this is less about this is less an issue of superhero superheroes and more an issue of not of not maintaining that consistency. You know, when you have when you have but you explain the consistency that I don't understand because I don't do Superman. Oh, Even though Superman is Christopher Lee, no, Reeves, in, shit. In Almost that film, wrong. you had, as I, as I mentioned before, they establish early on that um, the sensory overload from having everything enhanced due to yellow sunlight is overwhelming for most Kryptonians. And that's used yes. to, as, that is used to over, overwhelm some, some of the villains in that story. And then at the end, with Zod, they break that rule. Huh? I'm already overwhelmed. <laughs> <laughs> but the the point is 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 that I'm ne I've never been a fan of establishing rules and then breaking them. Huh, well, that's why they're there, right? And I guess I guess if if you're gonna if you're gonna break the if you're gonna break the rules, then get then give a reason for it. <laughs> right, you have to, uh, obviously, you have to have foundation. Mm. If you start breaking foundation rules, then okay, yeah, yeah, that's then that's kind of what I was trying to get at. Down. <laughs> but since since you meant since you mentioned comics, I am curious if if sometime in the future you would you would consider tr trying to do a comic set in the Valfaris universe. <sighs> I tried to do that before, and I met a great artist, and it kind of got fucked up, and it was crazy back then, and I kind of lost it, and I loved his artwork. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I I wouldn't be opposed to doing something like that. In fact, I wanted to do a comic book, um, kind of handbook to go with the game that had like all these secret kind of cheats and stuff in it that if you actually read the comic and read the book kind of like an old school um, guide <laughs> the way, when you were the way like, game uh, manuals used to be yeah yeah totally there would be little secrets in there and things that if you know um, yeah so when I was doing Slate I wanted that to happen mm -hmm. having this like kind of guide that went with it that had all these little secrets didn't tell you too much about the story but kind of uh, started out the character but i'm not very great at um, those kind of things it's... but it, yeah so, yeah. and it just got like a very um convoluted got fucked up egos and uh, normal art shit mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah i can i can certainly understand that i was i was just throwing that out there as <laughs> and you know you are. Get back in contact with me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm. I'm just throwing that out there as a, as a possibility. I don't. Obviously, I, there's only so much that I'm going to know about the inner workings of these kind of things. Like, I do. Right. I do my best, but I'm. I'm a monk, not a wizard. I'm not pondering the orb or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for giving us a place to come pray. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah. Oh. I I do I do remember it's so it's always funny when people when people act like oh you're a monk you shouldn't be drinking I'm like what do, what do you what do you expect monks to do when you're in the middle of nowhere <laughs> they made the best beer and wine Jesus what do you want about <laughs> yeah. yeah I've I've always I've always found that that kind of thing amu amusing especially since. The reason why I picked the the reason why I did the monk archetype was just because I wanted to I wanted to showcase that I don't I don't want to act like some know it all who who know who knows the score on th on things I'm j I'm constantly looking for new avenues, which yeah, is the I, way any I art a temple, a temple to come to so I can uh, like express all of my feelings and things that I went through creating the games. Yeah, almost like a confessional for video games. Um, I mean, maybe I could maybe I could walk around in cons with the portable confessional like Wolfwood and Trigun, you know, just just put it right over somebody's head. And what what would the repentance be? Drink a bottle of bacon soda. Must finish. Um, let's think. Shinobi won twice. <laughs> Oh, uh, if we're if we're gonna go if we're gonna go that far, I'll just tell them <laughs> go through one level of Kaizo Mario with no without without um using save states. Uh, there you go. It sounds like you've already got a rhythm going to me. <laughs> like yeah, <laughs> I've 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 seen I've seen people go through go through that and they they think oh oh it's it's still com it's still controlling like Super Mario World. I'll be fine. Then they end up dying in about eleven seconds. And I'm like, oh, th this is just the first I, level. It gets worse. I haven't played that either, but you know. um, there's plenty. Of, there's plenty of Kaizo ROM hacks with just about every form of Mario, and and it even and only got further when Mario Maker came along and allowed people to make custom levels. And some of the custom levels yeah. that people have made have been completely psychotic. <laughs> right, like I, I'm amazed at game players. They impress me so much. I mean, I'm a game player too. I'm not it's like uh, you know segregate myself from that, but yeah, the things that uh, players do with the games that I make is just like what the fuck. You've you've probably How seen some of the no upgrade challenges that people have done with with um Valfaris, and I'm pretty sure somebody's going to do that with Mechatherion too. Well, I'd love it. Oh yeah, we were, well during beta testing, we were, we already had that kind of uh yeah. Let's do like a no upgrades run. <laughs> No upgrades yeah. run and no and no hits. Those those are always the yeah. craziest ones. Hits were fucking insane. Or, um, I remember seeing one yeah. run that somebody did of Resident Evil Four where they used nothing but the knife. Yeah. And but it, yeah, in in that situation, I like to point out this as well. Like when you're dealing with these beta testers that are just amazing game players, and they they would just destroy your game in like hours and all this stuff, but. You know, the game is kind of meant to be short anyway. Yeah, and you've prob you've probably seen your fair share of um, speed run experiments. Yeah, I mean, I love them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it though, when it whenever it comes to that sort of beta testing, the story that always comes back that I always come back to that's a bit we a bit strange in the best and worst ways has to do with um, Alien Resurrection. And how the design the designers had claimed that because because in the early version people were going through the game with nothing but the pistol, they made it they they thought it was too easy when the game and in reality the game got slammed for being too hard. I have a hard time believing anyone went through that with just a pistol. <laughs> well, I mean that's the thing. It's like when we have all these like badass game testers coming in and testing our games, mm -hmm. you know, uh, with. <laughs> And I think this is a problem once again with modern games, especially with streamers and everybody playing it and all the elites playing it. It's like that's like maybe one percent of the people that are gonna play your game. Yeah. Don't cater to these people. I mean, listen. <laughs> like check out the bugs and things, but you know, we're not all those like uh, tryhards. Well if if you wanna see where that's if you want to see where that story ends, I always I always bring up what happened what's happened when um 
World of Warcraft started focusing on catering raids to the world first crowd, which is the yeah, yeah. 001 percent. I was going to bring up the same. The same with Diablo. There's some guys that got like billions of views like coming in, and now he's not liking the way it's going. So like, don't cater it. Is there anybody in charge here that knows what the vision is, or are you just catering your vision to the streamers? And <laughs> because somebody has to say like, no, that's not the goal. You can fight against a streamer, and it's like, uh, but it isn't good for me. It's like, well, maybe it's not for you then. Yeah, and the. Now I, I will ad I will admit I can't there's a certain glass house affair with when it comes to this because obviously I do intend on getting back into game streaming in ja in January but I'm not I'm not going to claim that I'm at that top level or anything like that I'm just one asshole in the middle of nowhere who like who likes games Right I, I'm not targeting them for being wrong but when people are pulling so much ad advertising from their streams mm -hmm. You know, and they're influencing these top developers in order to help make the game better for now the streamers and their money input and the company. It's like, guess what? The players get left out there. The actual ones that are playing. <laughs> yeah, that's that has been that has been a concern, especially since these days it seems like the the be, the the best ways to advertise is through like streamers or um. Or and, how come, and how come I'm paying the streamers? I n I never expect. And <laughs> if I if I if I um if I stream if I stream slain next month, I'm not going to be expecting payment from you. I know I've made I made that kind of thing clear with anything I do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I'm not talking. I'm mean, totally not talking about you. Yeah. You're drama, you're awesome, of yeah. course. <laughs> the, but um, I remember. Saying, I remember. Why like? Let these guys. I have a problem with streamers. Mm -hmm. Here we go. Why am I letting these guys play my game for free, or they're getting like money in through advertising, and I'm getting no part of that? Yeah, and I um, I remember I remember <laughs> talking with the developer of Nexus, and he br he brought up how he um he was he was willing to send send his game to to certain content creators, but they wanted they wanted a pay they wanted advanced payment, and that was. I always, I always find that kind of th that kind of thing very str that very strange, and I've made it a point to not ask for that kind of thing. Whenever, whenever, it, whenever advanced copies or, or the like is get is given to me, I'm always I'm always grateful for it. But I'm but it's not like it's something I ask for. It's something that that person chooses to um, send my way, and the reason yeah. why I've taken that approach yeah. is I know that. With a lot of the stuff I cover, it's small. It's small. Stu it's small studios who are do who are doing things that they're that they're passionate about, and it's hard enough yeah. for a lot of people to get to get eyes on their to get eyes on their stuff as it is. I don't feel like making it any harder it, for them. But some of those streamers streaming the small indie dev games that they're streaming are making more money than the devs are of their stream. <laughs> yeah, that is. That is that is certainly a an annoyance, and I don't I don't know what the answer is to that particular conundrum. I know well, no, I do know I do know that that one guy who was like who was like streamers streamers owe me money. That was the complete wrong way to do it. Yeah. Um, well, I just give the games to people to stream anyway. Yeah. But you know, but it's just a weird situation. Mm -hmm. I don't like uh, how streamers and influencers are able to take my artwork and put it out there mm -hmm. I don't get any of that revenue whatsoever and they make the bill of advertising yeah. through that period so mm -hmm. I didn't get anything yeah. <laughs> no like it, it's it goes back to the basic art thing of like don't worry don't worry dude you'll get exposure you exposure don't get exposure you die of exposure this is like free marketing for you so fuck that! I want the money. <laughs> I mean, when I any um any any particular game or the like that I've co I've covered, if it wasn't already free, it's something that I've I've already paid I've already paid for, and 
the goal the goal is not to try to try and get, to try and get myself a bigger profile or anything like that or get myself clout it's always been if i can if i can get if i can get somebody who's watching what i'm doing to go out and get and grab the game themselves then i've done my job cuz the cuz the proudest right. moments that i've had is when is when somebody comments on a video that i've done and and said that they ended up grabbing the game that i covered because and my in, my inputs ended up playing a factor in them getting it. It's that it's the it's the fact yeah, that I was able to help somebody to get it is oh, has always been the bigger priority for me. I understand what the other side is as well, but yeah. you're in a different position. Yeah, I get some people that stream my games who have advertising, who have millions of followers, and they're just like pushing another fucking shit game like having a laugh and a joke over it like doing their fucking like bro shit or their whatever <laughs> yeah that's like, oh my god you're just making money off me right now and i'm not getting any of that then you're getting exposure no you're making my game look like shit <laughs> well that's that's also the reason i tr i try and be very careful about it because again my cru i have been on a crusade for the last five years and that is to showcase what's out there yeah. and the and that's been, and in the in the process of that, it's it's always been about this. This is some, this is something that I find really cool, and I want it, and I want more people to try it. Um, I know I am fully aware that compared to other streamers or influencers or what have you, I'm in the minority. But I, but um, doing doing my own thing, regard regardless of popularity, how that's that's as me, that's as metal ethos as you can get, isn't it? Yeah. Doing your own thing, regardless of popularity. Mm -hmm. But that popularity get to a place where other people can take advantage of it, and then start using that in order for them to make money and not give you anything. Yeah. Oh. And this is kind of obviously how business works. I, I know what I'm part of because I'm an artist. I've had to deal with this all of my life, doing stuff that I love, and people selling it, and mm -hmm. then giving me money for it. You know, that's what it is. Oh. So I can make more stuff. I will. I will know this. If if I ended up drinking enough times and de and decided, I'm gonna I'm gonna make it. I'm gonna make a, I don't know. A, I don't know a card game inspired by Slain. I'd probably I'd probably send that to you and say, here, and say I ended up do I ended up doing this to see if I could do it. Do, um, s tell me tell me what you think of it. Tell me if tell me if I if it sucks or if I screwed something up, and th and that's that. And then I'll be saying it looks great. I'll take ten percent. Thank you. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> Although in, in that kind of situation, I would, I didn't even know if I if I'd even try and um if I'd even try and if I'd even try and sell it or if I, I'd probably say if you if you want to sell it you can you can sell it you can sell it on your end just um. Get no, I'm not doing that. Like, you already did it. I'm not selling your game that you made. <laughs> yeah. Oh. yeah. You sell it on ten percent. Yeah. Um. I'd probably I'd probably give you a lot more than ten percent if I'm being honest. <laughs> yeah, whatever. That's our agreement now. It's uh, it is documented. Because in that kind of situation, I'd be do I'd be doing it just to see just to see if I could even um do it. I don't even I don't even know if yeah. I even do it as do it as a card game or as or as something else. Um, Tons of fucking work. Mm -hmm. Um, but. It's but in that in that kind of situation, instead of instead of doing like ten percent, I'd probably do I'd probably do fifty fifty because um, it's it's more of a it's more of a I'm do it's I'm in I'm in a different I'm in a different no, no, position. You, no, no bullshit. I'll settle for seventy thirty seventy <laughs> to you. <laughs> well, okay, okay then I'll keep. And I'm I'm not even say I do I do card game. I'd, pr I'd probably more likely do. Um, role playing game use, using one of the many open licenses that are available. Uh, obvious, obviously, obviously, if I was to do that, there's be, there'd be a bunch of other things I'd have to I'd have to think over. But I'm just using that as a, a yeah, example so. of where 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 my head's at. And I th yeah, I'm, I, I'm running through the scenario right now. Mm -hmm. If you want to make a board game based on Slain and Valfaros, then carry on. Yeah. Oh. We've agreed to seventy thirty now. <laughs> yeah. Oh. You talk yourself down from the ten. <laughs> I'm a, I'm a monk. It's my nature to be humble. 
Thank you. <laughs> Some, sometimes a bit too humble for my own good, but that's a whole other story. I think that's what humble is, isn't it? Hmm? Really, humble is not something you do that's good. Yeah. You're not going to really get anywhere from there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but, but you know, just, until I, we die, and maybe you get like a massive upgrade. Yeah. But, um, with now with that in mind, when when we going back to the whole thing with testers, was there was there ever a situ was there ever a situation with either Slain, Valfaris, or Mechatherion where there where there was some combination that um that you that you didn't account for, that you didn't account for that ended up taking you by surprise or anything like that? Um, not really for me. Like maybe for Thomas. Because he's you know doing all the balancing, the coding, and all the weapons and things. Mm-hmm. I just do the artwork, yeah. and it, I, I guess in that um, respect, the only thing that I can really think that came in was um, accessibility mm-hmm. of like people not being able to see like a you know purple against red, <laughs> all these things, you know. Uh, Which that cer- that certainly makes sense because there's there's some color combinations that are gonna make things a bit a bit trickier to read. Um, yeah, I remember what the game design is like. We we just try not to do that. Yeah, I remember. Um, I remember r- when Mighty Number no. Nine came out, and I was ranting about how they were having these br- these bright purple projectiles on a bright purple background, and I'm like, you know how you know yeah. how projectiles are a different color than the background. This is what happens when you don't do that. Right. <laughs> so there are a, a few cases of that in a like Mecca because like people can't see you know, colors. Mm-hmm. Mostly males, obviously, because males are the only ones that are color blind. Yeah. <laughs> uh. Yeah. When you're getting into that spectrum, and I do use a lot of uh, the purples, greens, and like hot pinks and the neons <laughs> mm-hmm. like all over the place. Which, so it can kind of get confusing. Yeah, given the inspiration, I could certainly see it. Out of curiosity, given the given the slew of art, have you ever considered doing a doing anything like an art book for the, for this world? At any uh, point? Yeah. I've considered it. At some point, I mean, uh, Slain had its own, Valparis had its own. I hope, hopefully, we're going to do a physical of uh, like Mecca. I'm sure that I'll uh, throw in at least uh, like 20 of the original sketches. But the thing about it is, like, this game happens so fast, there's not really a, a bunch of art related to it except the art that I did in the game. But I didn't concept it and go through all that process in order to be able to make it. It's just like, Went straight into the game. <laughs> just, just a, just a case of this is what I, this is what I planned on, and, the, and just do, and just doing it right from there. Yeah. Which I can, I can certainly see the appeal of that. It, me, it means that there's a shorter grape, a shorter grapevine, a quicker pipeline to seeing what you had envisioned, um, on screen. I, I didn't need the pictures. I don't need the concepts. I don't need like. Uh, like the info on the character I'm creating because I already know what that is, and you know sometimes it comes out great, and uh, sometimes I probably should have concepted it first. <laughs> mm-hmm. I I remember um, I I remember seeing seeing Gareth Edwards constantly do constantly doing these little notes when he was doing photography just so the um et, just so the editing and all the post people would have an idea of what he wanted things to look like. Yeah, well, um, I'm not in that position. I have to make stuff look like I want it to look like. Yeah, I have nobody else to do that for me. <laughs> and I'm just again, I'm just using that as an example because I like doing parallels. Hmm? You know, the there's a, there's a huge tapestry worth worth exploring with with all, with all forms of art and. The, and course. there's more similarities between art and artists than a lot of people would think. Plus, it's an, plus it's an easy way to help give context to certain things. 
that's how that's how I've always seen it. But with the, with that in mind, I know it, I know it's an early question to ask, but where do you, where do you see the where do you see the story of Alfaris going ne going next? Uh, well, I got a lot of ideas. Well, let, I think I might let's... do. Um, mm -hmm. I think I might do a beat 'em up next, like a Streets of Slain kind of thing, like a Streets of Rage. There's this this entirely gore based um, beat 'em up, I guess. Mm -hmm. That it's oh. that it's certainly an interesting beast. Oh. Oh yeah, I know. The, I know the three characters. I know. I've already got them all sketched out. So like, yeah. oh, I have all these scenarios like set up already. And you're you're no stranger to melee weapons in in any of the games already. So, so foundations already yeah. there. Yeah, be kind of cool. Like more of a uh, like going back to the traditional golden axe kind of with a streets of rage kind of thing. If you're invoking golden axe, please don't tell me you're going to invoke those damn gnomes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if I was going to do that, I'd probably have to imply that at some point to give homage. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, if you have one, if you have a gnome getting blown up in the background that ha that has a blue cap, I I just I just give that a chuckle. But I just remember oh, how much I hated um f um trying to hit trying to hit those gnomes to get to get um, magic potions. Right, yeah. Well, now I know the first boss. Mm -hmm. But it's it's I can def I can definitely see that there's no short there's no shortage of po uh, possibilities with that particular setup, and oh, we have not good. But uh, like like I was saying once again, I'm moving kind of through the generations of uh, video games, mm -hmm. so it might be a. Uh, I mean, we were going to do a first-person shooter last time for Mecha, but I'm so glad I didn't do that because there are so many coming out. Well, there are, there are so many like uh, um, side-scrolling platforms as well. Yeah, so but... I didn't get involved in that. Mm -hmm. That was good, but maybe when that when all that's died down, I might attempt one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and. The... These days, these days, people aren't. These days, there's, there's, a, there's no. I will always be thankful for the fact that there's no shortage of variety in terms of what people can do with the games these days. Um, right. Yes. Yeah, so like, because of indie dev, like, like we can just do whatever the hell we want. Like all these triple A's are just stuck in this like, oh my god, pattern. It's just like a holding pattern of both like money or something. The. There's there's also the whole culture of conformity issue, which I ever, I think a lot I think a lot of folk um, don't don't um, don't look at that as critically as as possibly they should. This idea of te of telling people what you're supposed to do when doing a certain genre or subgenre or even tone. Well, there's the other side of that of like also people like uh, to know what the hell they're doing. Like uh, repetitive stuff. Like World of Warcraft is great. We're still doing the same stuff like twenty years later because yeah. it makes us feel good, and that's what it is. So it's some kind of a uh, comfort. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, com well comfort we is a thing. Like... Yeah. We don't like having to learn new things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like such a hardship, apparently. Whenever, whenever it comes to that, I've, al I've always asked, how, how did you end up learn? How did you end up learning the thing in the first place? You know, it's and I'm and I always, po I always posit that thing as more, as more of a um, philosophical thing instead of a question that I'm demanding an answer for. But it's definitely, it's definitely something to think about because we all, yeah, we all started somewhere. Yeah. It's not like we, it's not like we. Popped out with it with a certain a certain game style that we were going that we were going to always stick with. We had to everybody yeah, well, has to start somewhere. Well, it's back to the martial arts kind of thing. When you stick in your stance, you're going to get like kicked over pretty fast. <laughs> you got to be bouncing around, changing, 
You can still use the same technique and skills and things that you have in your battles. Yeah, and um, I'll probably have to share that vi that video I came across of um, a Taekwondo t tournament from 99 versus one in 2020. I already know. And <laughs> just, just, how, just how crazy a lot of the movement is. In f and I think and it's kind of it's reverse gymnastics. It's just got way better. Taekwondo got like way shitter in the Olympic. <laughs> but I cert I certainly would be looking forward to to seeing how to seeing how um, the world of Alpharus expands with with whatever installment com comes in the future. Even if it isn't a even if it isn't a beat em up. Even if it's something completely different. The that that it would still. It will always be the same feel. It will always be the same story and the same characters. But you know, we might switch genres. Mm -hmm. There's, there's, cer there's certainly nothing. There's really really nothing a problem. Wrong yeah. Um, it's like we're still telling the same story, and we want to, like the the players of our games to, like experience all the games, not just experience a side scroller shooter that's pixels. Ex mm -hmm. Experience this stuff. We're gonna like you know. I think, uh, you know, take players of our games through, um, like, my journey of video games. <laughs> All the arts has changed and how, like, techniques change through those, like, you know, well, well, 35 years now that I've been doing it. Mm -hmm. right, and... I think that was a fun game. It's like, this is about playing games. Yeah, and I, yeah. I, will, I will certainly look forward to seeing uh, what, co what comes but yeah. with with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens here. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Well, thank you for letting me back in here and doing my confessions again. <laughs> Any, anytime, man. It's all it's always fun having you on. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs>